And I say segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. The Supreme Court said you had to desegregate and you had to do it now. And this was not going to happen. The judge sort of was living and breathing judicial independence. Once he was appointed, he was able to bring that independent temperament. Even though the judge had life tenure, life tenure doesn't protect you from somebody firebombing your guest cottage. First off, uh, Al, Al and Robert, Bob, uh, first, thank you for your time. Thank you for, for taking, you know, some of your, some of your time for, for this interview. Um, I really want to talk to you, and I, I want to congratulate you, Baba, for, uh, you know, because of the, for the documentary, the judge. I absolutely love that. I, I think I'm, I'm a huge fan of documentaries, and mostly because you always learn something new, or you learn something new. Uh, no, nothing about so I, I want to congratulate you on on the an excellent documentary in my opinion I think everything I I, I saw nothing wrong with it so uh, I, you know I know uh, Robert is the the director and I'll you're the producer I'm gonna I'm gonna ask make, I'm, I think I'm gonna ask questions directly to each other and you I want to start with Al because I want to know what you know what motivated you to produce what what, what told you that I need to tell the story. Well, I uh, was familiar with the judge. Then I moved into an office that was owned by his son and started to get more interested. The more research I did on him, the more interesting he became. And he was just one of those people that appear in history from time to time that seemed to be in the middle of everything. And he was in the middle of all these high profile cases. And he just, um, for whatever reason, he was suited for that role. He could handle high profile cases. He could handle the pressure. He kind of liked the action. And um, in many ways, he became sort of like the, the go-to judge. He would get sent all over the country to hear high profile cases that no one else would hear. So he's just a very interesting character, very kind of Frank Capra-like character. So very, very all American, uh, kind of heroic, but but modest. Not seeing himself as a, a, a hero, just doing his job. That was his attitude. He was just doing his job, doing what he was supposed to do, upholding the law. He was very devoted to the law and very devoted to the courts. Um, seeing the courts as a great leveler, where the the little guy could get his his case heard. Um, so as I said, he, he was just a Frank Capra character. Um, so he became, he was very compelling. I, you know, I, I'm glad you mentioned George Caprio because I think that's the first thing that came to my mind when I, you know, when I, when I watched watching the documentary, obviously to, you know, Caprio to us is the, the you know, uh, uh, it's our judge of this generation who's basically doing going through that goes through that uh, line, line of thinking how we you go through uh, day to day. Um, I want to you know I want to talk to Robert. I, I know I, I know you know uh, what drove you what you know what made you want to work when you know when Al brought you in what what when you, what convinced you to be part of this project. I was familiar with the judge because my early days in my career, I worked in television, I worked in film departments and news and documentaries. So I was very familiar with the judge uh, during his heyday, if you will. And when Al came to me with the idea, um, I told him that, that I was familiar with the judge, very familiar with a lot of the cases that came before his bench. And um, since we were based out of Richmond, Virginia, and he had such a reputation, a wide reputation. I thought it was possible for us to be able to raise the funds needed to make the film. And uh, we spent about a year doing that and setting up a nonprofit so we could uh, solicit money, grants. And that's pretty much how it got started. 
during maybe this maybe a question for the both of you during the process of the of the film of the documentary are there many people that you you know, had the opportunity to interview which which one which one you know which individually give you you felt that it gave you the most you know the most input into the life of, of who gave you the most input into the life of the judge maybe i'll, I'll, I'll first uh, that's a that's a tough question because everybody we interviewed had a different take on the judge mm -hmm. and different stories about the judge, but they all had this tremendous respect for him, not only as a, as a legal figure, but as a, as a person, as a human being. And uh, people from all over, from both ends of the political spectrum, love the judge just because he was, he was devoted to the law. So, I mean, people that stand out were uh, late, Governor Belisles, also Senator Tim Kaine, who had been sort of a uh, surrogate clerk to the judge because at the time he was engaged to Ann Holton, who was clerking to, for the judge, who he later married. So he, he spent a lot of time with the judge on the weekends so he could be with, with Ann because the judge worked all the time. So his clerks worked all the time. So in order to see Ann Tim Kaine had to go to the judge's chambers. Uh, but I, I mean, it's really hard to pick. I mean, uh, Judge Wilkinson knew the judge very well and, and you know, had tremendous respect and actually love for him. So they all had these great stories. And, and as Bob can tell you, we've got hours and hours of material that we just couldn't fit into the movie. Yeah. And, that everyone had a story. People were calling us up with their judge stories. We couldn't get them in the movie either. <laughs> so uh, it's a tough question. There was there was a lot of material, as Al just said, but two people that stand out for me, all of them gave so much to the film. Uh, of course, coming from different perspectives, but former governor of Virginia, uh, Governor Halton, who was in his 90s when we went to interview him, and his uh, reflection, his recall was, was excellent. And I think he really brought a lot to the documentary because of when he was governor, so much of the issues with busing were at his doorstep uh, as, as governor and he had children. So he had to deal with it uh, on that level as a father and also as the chief executive of the state. So, I thought his uh, stories were really very, very important uh, to, to the big story. And also uh, Wilkerson, uh, another one, uh, I, I loved his perspective on some of the ways the judge handled certain things. Uh, he added a little quiet sense of humor to it, if you will, from a legal profession, for, for a legal profession, but anyway, all, I think everyone that participated in the film brought some real quality uh, stories to what we were doing. I, I didn't have this question, but I, I also, I'll say something that, that, you know, just maybe sort of this question just to follow up on the previous one. Um, yeah, I think that I, to me, the film commentary is perfect in, in the essence that it covers everything on the different bases. But I, I'll, I'll just say, you know, there are a lot of stuff that we, we, we couldn't put in, we, 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 we have a lot of, a lot of information that we, you know, we, just, we just couldn't fit on the, on the film. Is there something in particular, maybe it's enough of, I have a question for the both of you. Is there something in particular that you wish you would have, you know, put on the movie that you, you, you decided to, to, to cut out at the end, all you first? Oh, I mean, there were uh, just some really great stories. Uh, uh, there was, uh, um, I'm trying to remember one in particular. There, there was one that a, 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 actually a lawyer who couldn't, um, we couldn't fit in the film. Um, uh, David, um, oh, what, was that, what was his name? Um, anyway, he, told, he, he used to be a uh, U.S. attorney, an assistant U.S. attorney, and they had a prisoner that they needed to, for, for, I'm trying to make this as short as possible. They had a prisoner that they needed to transfer from 
uh, state prison in Virginia to federal prison for the for that prisoner's safety because he was helping the U.S. Attorney's Office cr crack a counterfeiting ring that was being run by the prisoners. They were using the prison print shop to counterfeit hundred dollar bills. So they've got to get this guy uh, uh, assigned to federal prison and, and they had to have a hearing in front of the judge, which was canceled because things didn't go right. So it was delayed. So they, they, they finally decided that what they were gonna do, the judge said, okay, bring him out to the house where the judge was having a big party. So they bring the prisoner out there, they've got the lights going, they've got a caravan of police cars, they pull up in front of the judge's house, they ring the doorbell, the prisoner's in handcuffs, they, and they ring the bell, the judge's wife answers the door. And she says, well, he's gonna, he's gonna do this out on, in the Florida room. And can you take the cuffs off him? So they take the handcuffs off him, they, and they take him out to the Florida room. But while they were bringing while they were coming up the judge's driveway, the prisoner turns to the U.S. attorney and says, wow, I think I'm gonna really like federal prison. <laughs> and so, that, so then they're out in the Florida room, the judge comes out and, th and they were having a big celebratory brunch for then Associate Justice uh, Powell, who was a Supreme Court judge. So there's a, there's a waiter out on the uh, Florida room and the judge says to the prisoner, okay, is there anything you would like? And the prisoner said, well, I really like an orange juice. So the judge says to the waiter, okay, can you get him an orange juice? And then the waiter says, can you make it a large? And the judge says, okay, get him a large one. And what the, uh, uh, Mr. Baugh, who was the, the, the US attorney said, it just, it, it illustrated the judge's humanity because he was treating this prisoner like a guest in mm -hmm, his house mm -hmm. and explaining exactly what was gonna happen, exactly what the process was, how he was being transferred to federal prison, but just you know, had the guy sitting there like he was a guest at the party, talking to him as a human being. And that was kind of typical of, of the judge. He treated people like they were people, not prisoners, not defendants, but as people. And so that was a great story. We, we couldn't get it in. And, and actually, Mr. Baugh does a better job of telling it than I did. So that was one. Well, Robert, you yeah. got one that you want to add? Uh, I really have more than one, but I'll just do one. I, I think his, his personal secretary for many years, um, we, uh, we had uh, the opportunity to talk with her on camera. And one of her stories, she got into his face. And I always liked the way she framed uh, the story about when he would be out on the street, uh, streets of Richmond or anywhere for that matter of fact. And when he would see someone that was homeless or asking for money, he always reached in his pocket and gave money. And one day she just turned to him after they had been out on the streets in Richmond for lunch and said, Judge, why do you why do you keep giving money to these homeless people? A lot of them do drugs, and, and you're just maybe helping their habit. And he was such a devout Catholic. I think Catholics are known for guilt trips. He mm -hmm. uh, he made the comment back to her, uh, "You never know when Jesus is watching." So mm -hmm. I mean, I, I thought that really showed a, an aspect of his personality. Mm -hmm. All these stories that what Al just said and what I'm saying now were much longer when they were being uh, told by the, inter the people we were interviewing. So it's kind of hard sometimes to cut and get the full effect of that, that moment. Uh, if we had uh, a three hour documentary, I think the one Al said and the one I just said, I'd like to have both of them in the film, but we only had an hour. So, yeah. I, I, I wanna, you know, when I end with two, two more questions, you know, and I think you already had, uh, you know, answered this one, but I'm gonna maybe expand on it. Um, what you know, what made what made the judge Trevor stand out so much that he they, he was always. What did you guys learn from him to, during the during the, the film process that you know is your understanding now that 
he was the go-to guy for such you know high profile pictures what made him stand out that now you get, you're thinking now was okay now i understand why he was the the guy that they they, that they had to choose for x and y uh, uh situation what what made him stand out oh maybe you're first well i think it was just his his love for the law and he really felt that you know justice needed to be done and the fair thing needed to be done and also he was a world war ii veteran and he had been on a b-17 bomber flying over austria and germany and um you know it's just like when you've been through that kind of experience where like people are shooting at you and your plane is getting you know big holes in it um that you know going into a, a courtroom doesn't seem so threatening and again he just he just saw this as his job and so it would be like you know whoever assigned the cases would say well we've got a tough one like there was one in Greensboro, North Carolina, where none of the federal judges down there wanted to touch the case. It was a, a, a complex case between like the, uh, the KKK and like the American Communist Party. There had been like a shooting at a, at a demonstration. And so he just got the call and, and they asked him the question, you know, would you go down there? There's a, there's a lot of tension. And he said, sure. And he had been, he also been a criminal defense attorney, which is kind of unusual. Usually criminal defense attorneys don't get to be judges, mm -hmm. but, but he did. So he, he, he liked the, the action of the trial. And again, he, he just believed in the law so much that he felt it was his duty to, if, if there was a case that needed somebody to step in, he would step in because he wanted to see justice done. He wanted to see the fair thing done. Uh, so I, I just think it was all those kinds of experiences, but you know maybe the the World War II as, as when the the thing was going on with the segregationist, uh, mm -hmm. he's getting the schools mm -hmm. where his his life was being threatened. Mm -hmm. The comment that the judge would make is, "Well, uh, Hitler couldn't kill me, so I'm not worried about them." Uh, you know, it's just kind of like that. I mean, he had a sense of humor. That's cool. That's really yeah. cool. Yeah. Robert, you want to add something? Uh, I think that the only thing I would add to that would be that I think his um, his instincts uh, were very good. Uh, he was, I think, he was a people person, and I think he read the room and read the scenarios that he was involved in very well. Uh, I, th I think you have to be a good listener to be a judge. I think you you really do have to be a very good listener, and clearly he was, and uh, his instincts I think really uh, helped him navigate some very complex issues and complex people uh, in the process. I think anyone's gonna get a sense of what you just said when they see the the commentary because I think that's something that you guys did perfectly. You know, getting that essence out there. What everything you said right now, it comes through the movie perfectly. So I'm gonna, I wanna, I wanna, I gotta say that. I'm gonna provide you on it. I wanna end this this interview with 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 somebody that people are gonna notice when they start obviously watch, uh, watching the documentary. It's that that's a distinctive voice that's narrating the 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 movie. Somebody that we obviously a lot, a lot of people know already. Justin the Rocks. How how I, maybe that this question goes through all. How did Justin? How did you know? How did you get him into board into the, the, the movie and the documentary one? What was his reaction to, to the story, uh, what the documentary is about? Okay, well, the, 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 the way I got to essentially meet Justin was, was through his mother. Uh, I, I knew his mother. And I, one day I asked her if she thought that Justin would be interested in narrating the film, because I know he, he's, he's a, he'd done a lot of voice acting. and. Um, so she said, well, I don't know, ask him. And she gave me his email address. So I asked him and he said, well, can you send me something? So I sent him one of our early, uh, you know, as we we're working on the final cut, one of the early versions of the film wasn't the final version. But so I sent him that and he got it. And I got an email back from him and it, it said, got it, love it. What can I do to help? <laughs> so he, he just, 
I think the judge's character appealed to him, the, the message in the movie appealed to him. And um, I, I mean, he, he did a great job for us. And, and I think the fact that he, he liked the story really kind of made it happen because, you know, it was, you know, it wasn't a high profile film. He wasn't going to get a lot of money. So he really wanted to do it and helped us navigate all the various hurdles to get him into the film. So uh, I think he just liked the project and it, it was very appealing to him. And, and I mean, he was just great to work with. I mean, Roy, you want to add something about uh, Justin, working with Justin? Um, I liked his dog a lot. <laughs> he had a great dog. Uh, first time I saw him, I was walking, we were at Sound Studio in New York. That's where we did the recording. And I went out to get some water or something to drink. I was walking down a hall and this rather husky dog comes around the corner. Well, I immediately assumed it was his dog. And then while we were doing the session, there was a moment when I was in, in the uh, room, in the recording studio with him, and I heard this noise. His dog was scratching at the door. They were very much, <laughs> they didn't like to be separated. <laughs> and Justin said that had happened before. So we had to take a break, just a moment, and get the dog off somewhere. And anyway, yeah, nice dog, nice guy, like Al said, easy to work with. I think, you know, Justin's sentiment about the, the documentary is going to be something that will resonate with a lot of people and a lot of people are going to enjoy the, the documentary because we can, a lot of people will, will, will be able to relate, you know, to, to what the judge had, you know, went through back in the days. And, you know, and, and sadly enough that we're still going through those times in this specific, you know, century, you know, so many years later. So I think, again, uh, I was glad to do you, the two of you on the film, but my main documentary, like I saw nothing wrong with it. Uh, maybe, like I said, I went, maybe I went a little bit more, maybe a little, like, like Robert said, maybe a, three, a, a, a TV show, three, a, a mini series, something like that, but you, you can give us a little bit more. But I think what you did was perfect, and, and, and I think you encapsulated perfectly or enough of what the essence of, 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 of Josh R. Who, who I was. So, again, Congratulations, congratulations you on the on the on the on the documentary and thank you for your time. Thank you.